Yeah, good morning. Good morning. You are you look gorgeous this morning, sis. Good and fresh face. See, I got all beat. I got up all early and got beat. You mm -mm. look stunning. Thank you so much. But it is a beautiful beat. I love it. And I love the braids. I'm here Thank for it. Thank you. Thank you. I love yours as well. This is so, so for people just now tuning in or just joining us, um, we followed each other on social media, but this is our first time actually being in any sort of conversation outside of uh, email, just like an email with me inviting you to the to my platform. So I'm excited to have a conversation with you because I've heard nothing but good things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so Hope, for those of you who do not know, Hope is a motivational speaker. She's an author. She's a community organizer. She is a kick-ass activist, in my opinion, um, inclusion specialist and journalist. You wear so many damn hats. I have yes. to start off, my first question, Hope, is just, how are you on September 13th? And you're on the East Coast, right? Yes. Okay, so it's afternoon for you. How, how are you? Tired. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm tired, to say the least. I'm, I'm just, I think that I'm learning uh, and what I've been trying to, I guess, like incorporate into my schedule is time to take care of myself because mm -hmm. uh, I don't do a good job at it. I really don't. I, I don't do a good job at just like taking time for hope. Um, and over this past week or so, I realized how that's actually affected my health in a very serious way. So I have been trying to be very intentional about taking time for hope and just loving on me and allowing myself to like step back from all of those hats. Um, today is not one of those days because as soon as I get off of here, <laughs> I have a couple of articles to finish and some other stuff that I'm doing. but. It's about the hustle. Like for me, it's all about making sure that all of those five streams of income are always coming in. So. Yeah, see, that is something that I'm always able, like I've listed like you, um, Ashley Marie Preston, Raquel Willis, it's like I forever tip my hat to you ladies. And like I said, this is our first time in conversation, but I, you know, I know Raquel and Ashley like on a, on a different level, so to speak. And um, I just, like this year for me, even though I'm not in the activist space and we can talk about that later, I don't feel like I'm in the activist space. But mm -hmm. uh, I know for, for this year for me has been draining. So I'm like checking in on everyone like you good, sis, because gotcha. it's draining for me. I know that, you know, this has to be a whopper for, for some of you all who are constantly in that space. Definitely. So, uh, so Hope, before I get into like what you've been reading, watching, listening to, I have to ask, I started out this episode by playing um, Gladys Knight's Love Overboard. You know Gladys and Patty are going head to head tonight oh. at 5 p.m. my time, I think 8 p.m. your time. Who's your yeah. money on? Are you going for Atlanta or Philly? Um, so I got to give it to Mama Patty. And it's only because I grew up in a Patty household. My grandmother... Okay. When I tell you, like, I had no idea of the joys of Patty until, like, my grandmother, like, made it known that this was a Patty house. <laughs> and, like, but I, I do, like, don't get me wrong. I've, I've actually met Gladys a couple of times. Very sweet lady. But for me, it's the Patty music. There's that soul. There's something really, um, and I know that this is backwards to, like, compare her to somebody that's younger than her. But um, there's something that is Fantasia mm -hmm. about Patty that takes you to church that like really just jumps up in you and like i don't know i just i don't know if i get that same feel from gladys i feel like gladys calms me she's like the sativa <laughs> um and okay I, okay of an upper yeah see for for me i'm torn because i'm someone i did not grow up in a in, in necessarily either one of them household like i was like whitney luther like around that aretha we were big aretha household but uh what I find most interesting is that I fell into Patty like in high school, like mm. watch like with the inception of YouTube, and I saw some of her like drag esque the labels and like these like grandiose mm. performances. I was like, this lady is off the Richter scale. And then of course, you know that infamous appearance on the Tyra Banks show during the cooking segment. Like Patty is funny to me. Patty is the reason I tried Milk of Magnesia as a primer for my makeup. Like I heard that from Patty Labelle. <laughs> yes. But I always say that Gladys, like if you really fall into Gladys's catalog, this is why I'm torn because Gladys has brown liquor music. Like Gladys's lyricism will have you, like tonight, for example, I'll be drinking wine. Because if I drink something hard, if I drink the hard liquor, the text might get to going. And I don't okay. want the text going, you know, when, okay. when Gladys starts 
to say, to say, okay, all right, okay, okay, I feel yeah, it. Yeah, Ira, your woman, neither one of us, like, Gladys' lyricism can sometimes, whoo, I'm getting hot thinking about it, like, it's, she'll send you there. See, and that's why, this is why this is the Patty household. Because <laughs> I don't know those text messages going out. I can't. And yeah, and Patty's good too, but I just had to know black woman to black woman whose side you're on, because this is going to be a good one. And I think that it should be noted how the women are bringing in all the ratings for verses. People, the, the, the public, the numbers have shown that the people are really only excited about the women folk stepping into the biz, into the building and battling it out. But you know what? Let me tell you something about that. I feel like that's a part of that toxic culture that we have where we put, where we enjoy pitting women against each other. Mm -hmm. Like, right? We don't enjoy the idea of seeing two men scrap it out because we've been taught all our lives, especially in Black community, right? We've been taught all our lives, like, no, like, Black men come together, you know, build community. But Black women, we could throw hands all day and these guys are going to sit around and record. And I think that that's a part of this culture. And I think that while it's amazing that black women are pulling in those numbers it also is very telling to the way that we like to see competition amongst black women even though we say we don't and i think that that's something to be talked about as well you know what i hadn't even thought about it in that framework until you just laid it out like that because i know that there's been a lot of com conversation about like missy who would she go uh head to head with and a lot of people are like pit her up against a guy i think the only um like man versus woman versus was like uh John Legend and Alicia Keys. I, wasn't I, that the one? Missy and Timbaland. There's nobody that can hang with Miss, Missy other than Timbaland. Like, not hit for hit. I, okay. I, I don't see it. Anybody outside of Timbaland is going to get demolished. Period. I, I, I can see that. I totally can see that. But what was the production? Because, you know, Missy got hits. Missy got the vocals. She can sing. She can rap. She can produce. <laughs> Timbaland can't do all of that. But my thing is, the hits that Timbaland has produced for people, True. I mean... Fair. Come on, come Fair. on, girl records are, you know, so Missy would have to come with her hard stuff if she was going to try to win against Timbaland. Fair, fair. So the next topic, you know, at the beginning of quarantine, I was uh, on live and I was talking about how I hadn't come up with these definitive stages of what I was going through. But I, what I can tell you, Hope, is that I felt like the spirit of reconciliation swept through the land around March, April, like when we were at the beginning of this. There was a lot of reaching out and kind of like, you know, either saying your piece or making amends. With, at least on my end, it was happening to me. I was putting it out there. And one of the top stories that damn near broke the internet this week was after 30 years, Will Smith and the icon, the original Aunt Viv, Janet Hubert, are reunited for the uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air reboot coming to HBO Max. What was your reaction to this? First of all, when I saw her picture, I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, wait, yes. I mean, I saw Light Skin Viv in, in the other picture of, like, the full cast, but when I saw Will sitting there, I was like, oh, wait. So so Miss Janet is back in the building, right? And I don't know what capacity they're going to bring her in. I'm not even sure how they're going to work that out because it doesn't seem like they've cut out the light yeah. skin. So I'm confused, but also very excited to see how it's going to come together. Because Will is an amazing creator. So I'm, I'm just, I'm really just like sitting back and just tilting my hat and waiting on everything to just fall. Because I'm, I'm excited, but I'm really excited, especially after all these years and after her holding him and Jada accountable for that whole, you know, hoopla with the Oscars. The fact that as a man, he can still come back and say, you know what, I need you to be a part of this. That to me was like, okay, chef's kiss. I can deal with this. Mm -hmm. I, you are on foot with me. I love it. It showed that he put his red table where his mouth was, you Ooh, know. Or, or Jada. Because <laughs> it seemed like everybody done been on that table, but that's another conversation. <laughs> yeah. That it's da Daphne Reed is light skin and Viv, who is um, Tim Reed's wife. Tim Reed starred as Ray Campbell on Sister Sister. That's his wife. But uh, oh, yes, and the old school pictures of them, they're, they're a really good couple. Like together, like I was looking at them at. She's always giving me like Tina Knowles teas, like always giving me very refined. And, and so has he, he's always been like a very like well-to-do, like man, like I, so I can see that. I never even knew that, but. Yeah, yeah. And I should note that Peacock, which is uh, NBC's streaming NBC. service, they have a separate spinoff titled Bel Air that has nothing to do with the HBO Max one. I don't know what, I don't know what Peacock is doing, but it's, 
it's coming. We got one coming to Peacock and one coming to HBO Max. But I was excited about the, the Janet Hubert sighting because I was like, Lord, you know, 2020 is full of surprises, full of and both good and terrific, like, surprises. So uh, I take it, I don't want to assume, but do you watch Pose? I do, and thank you for not assuming that. I do watch Pose, but thank you for not assuming, because I hate when people are just like, I know you are watching Pose. I'm like, what are you trying to say? They're like, but yes, I do watch the show. So it was just announced via Variety and TV Guide that Pose is about to start production up again next month, and they're hopping ahead to 1994. I have to know, and as someone who watches, because just between you and I, Hope, and everyone that's going to go back and watch this and currently watching this, I really wasn't a fan of season two for multiple reasons. Loved season one. I really wasn't a fan. I, with season two, I liked half of the episodes and hated half of the episodes. Agreed. Agreed. So, this, this upcoming season, they're jumping ahead to 1994. What are your thoughts? What are you feeling? Fashion, storylines, any projected storylines? What, what, what say you? I mean, I can't really say too, too much because I'm friends with, like, half of the cast. So, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm like, I've been privy to probably a little bit more information than I should be. But mm -hmm. I will say the one thing that I have not heard anything about from any of my friends um, that I need is that fashion to be on point. I need door knockers. I need dookie braids. I need, I need all of that to be happening. And, like, if this costume, I know, like, uh, Lady Deja... And D Tranny Bear, uh, they usually work on the series, and I know that they're gonna bring it because they're like both of them creatively with makeup and hair are so amazing. So yeah. I doubt that they're gonna let us down. They've uh, actually, I believe, they're not only nominated, but I, I think that they're going to definitely take that home for best period piece sort of makeup and hair. Never, never have I ever outside of um, everybody hates Chris have I seen a, a production where it's. I never feel like I leave the time period. Mm. When I'm watching those, I feel like I am right there in that time period. It's so timeless. The they're they're taking very special care to make sure that you are not breaking that fourth wall, and I love it. Um, but I need to see the '90s because I was the '90s baby. Like I need to see, you know, what my mamas and them were wearing. I need to see salt and pepper yeah. and spice. I need all of that. So I'm excited. And I, I have full confidence in the hair and makeup team, too. It's funny that you mentioned that because one distinct memory that stands out to me where I felt like they did kind of break that kind of mold of being in it was last season when they wrapped the woman's house in the condom. When the news reporter showed up, she was a black woman and she had natural hair. I said, oh, not in 1990. That was, that's something that I, I, rem I distinctly remember saying. A black, a black woman on the air as a reporter with natural hair in 1990, fantasy land. You're right. But also, like, like we both agree, second season wasn't... I mean, I really didn't... Uh, like, I got, like, it was kind of like after Candy's refrain, I was over it, you know? Um, I, should I, I, hope, hope, I should hope... I should note that I watch Pose with the East Coast, because my mom lives in Chicago, so I'd be streaming her, her cable out here on the West Coast. Right. But the night that Candy's... The, the Candy episode happened, Angelica hit me up and invited me to the standard. She was having a viewing party. So mm -hmm. I didn't know what to expect. So I watched the episode early and I was like, I think my brain could not separate the character, the from, character from the person. <laughs> and I just was like, when I got to the standard, because the other people hadn't seen the episode yet. And I was like sitting next to her and I just wanted to, I was like, I'm joking. <laughs> I was so dramatic because I was like, you all just have to watch. I, I was trying to maintain my composure, no spoilers. But I sat like right next to her on the couch and I was like, cause we ended up pulling up at the same time together. And I, I recorded a little video like joking around when she hopped out of her car. And I was like, she, you all, she's fine. She's here. <laughs> Love it. it, Love it. it that rocked me like none other. Oh, and because also, you know, since we're just speaking candidly, it just felt so unnecessary to me. And it also felt like that's when her acting chops were utilized, like ghost candy got like mo more play than than uh alive on this side of of earth candy it just i just uh but i love the beach episode it redeemed it's like the beach episode is one of my favorite i love the beach episode um but i will say the season i think that the writers room is so split uh at least mm -hmm. for now that i'm hoping that we get a steady 
current of, of people who are on the same level with the same mentality to tell the same story. I think that when you have shows like Pose that have a multitude of writers in the writer's room who are actually contributing to the script that goes out. And so like this episode was written by Stephen Canal. This episode is written by Janet Mock. This episode is written by somebody mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's where we get those moments of us just kind of being like, Ooh, okay, this one was dope. This one wasn't this one. And then that's also where that like sort of like competition factor comes in. Cause it's like, well, all of Steven's episodes were like this, but then all of Jenna's episodes were like this. And I just want, I wish that they, um, I'm not sure how they operated, but I wish that there was like a lead writer that kind of just like ties in everybody's ideas mm -hmm. versus so that is written by one person and then another person. Cause I think that that's where the disconnect comes from. I, I'm hoping that in season three, especially because it'll be a little bit more au courant, that we'll see a lot more people's writing abilities come out when they can actually write for a time period that's a little bit more familiar. Because I think that yeah. that's the issue is that people having to go back and do research, y'all know how mm -hmm. it is, I want to do all of that. And so sometimes people stick in a black news reporter with natural hair, you know, in 1990. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that that will change with this season. But I'm, either way it goes, I know that the actors have been ready to get back on set. I love India and like all of my little people. So like, I know that they're ready to, you know, continue telling that story and I can't wait to see it. Yeah, me neither. So let's move on to a more salacious story. I got bullet points because I intentionally did not want to dive into this story because it left my head spinning. I'm sure you heard about Jessica Krug or Krug in New York. She was going by Jess La Bambera. And you're from Miami. Because mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna talk about, you went to an HBCU too, right? Yeah, we're going to talk about, I did too. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> okay, so of course with these, uh, with these types of top, are you familiar with this story, by the way, with Jessica? Not fully. I've been trying to like take myself a little bit out of it, but I can't help but to hear some of the things that are happening. Yeah, because of course the conversation is coming back up, like where people are not understanding that both race and gender are social constructs, but they operate in different ways because they're like, why yep. can't you but from what I've been seeing, this woman was way more insidious than a, a Rachel Dolezal, or excuse me, N Nikechi Diallo. Oh, she changed her name. <laughs> you Nikechi know what? No, go I'm Diallo. Figuring I'm done with this interview. <laughs> <laughs> no hope say. Um, <laughs> but um, this woman was like going around like checking people, essentially like telling them in so many words that they're not black enough. Like there was a lot of, like I said, insidious things that she did. She bounced back and forth between identities. I should note that she's from like the suburbs in Kansas while all the while perpetuating she's from like this very specific neighborhood in New York. And I'm just like, like people of course were coming out saying there's no way that people would have believed that this is a black woman. But I think that it's important to note that blackness literally runs the gamut. Like it literally runs the gamut. Because I, I was seeing a lot of people making uh, that argument as well. And I was just like, but the thing about it is that we are literally having uh, debates about the idea of not debating people who are mixed race for their blackness, right? And so I can understand very clearly how she might have gotten away with that. And nobody questioned it because there are so, especially right now with the climate that we're having, us being black, we want to try to accept all black people and make sure that everybody black is in the fold. And so if somebody comes up to us and says that they're black, especially in a time where it's not necessarily popular or happening to be black. Uh, I can't believe I just said happening. Who, who am I turning into? Anyway, um, I, I think that, you know, it's easy to accept that narrative because you don't want to take away someone's blackness simply because of their skin or because they, you know, their white genes are coming through a little bit more. And so, I mean, she she ran the gambit at the right time, but I, I think that it's absolutely ridiculous. But what's crazy is that, why, I'm trying not to use that, what's wild, excuse me, is that uh, <laughs> um, she, from, like I said, from accounts that I had seen, like on Twitter, she was like checking people, not in a Rachel Dole, because Rachel Dolezal was kind of like minding her business, so Very to speak. Very you know, taking up space and taking opportunity. But this woman was running up on you, allegedly, mm -hmm. telling you that some of your talking points, some of your hot takes are anti-Black and X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z. And I'm like, what in God's name is going on with? And I think there's something to be said about white women in academic spaces. What do you think it is? Is it something in the water that these higher education type white women are kind of trying to pull this off and why why don't why do you think that we don't see this in white men as much as we see this in white women 
Because my thing is, white men don't need to be or need to have or add flavor to be, you know, like accepted into society, right? When it comes down to white men, they hold this patriarchal, you know, level that most people can't even ascend to, including black men. But when you're talking about women, there's a flavor that black women have that everybody wants, except without the blackness, right? So you look at white women who just don't feel like they're getting attention or like they have the the right to say certain things or like they have the right to be boisterous and all of the things that black women typically you know get frowned upon for these white women take it throw some blonde hair on it walk up in here calling it yours and then everybody praises them for it right and i think that when you see issues where people who are not only looking for the ability to be able to do the things that black women do without the backlash are also inundated with an academic mindset. That shit drives them crazy because it's one of those things where now they feel right. Like they know our history better than they know our, better than we know our history. And then they also feel like they have a better mindset by which to speak on it. And so mm -hmm. I think that a lot of those white women take that white women privilege, take the ability that they know that there are a lot of black men who are lost in the sauce credit to consciously. Um, who are just going to kind of sort of flock to those women who don't have those black aesthetics but have that black sort of mindset and that black social rendering and and that's what they do they pull it because they can and that's how they you know inundate themselves into our community and our culture and our hairstyles and all that good jazz but i mean we don't see it a lot in black men i mean i see a lot of people naming people but i want there's a difference between what we used to call i guess for lack of a better term wiggas and what these women are doing what rachel dole is all and this very very different very different, very different from the catchy Ngozi diallo and jessica correct <laughs> They're, they're, what, what they're doing is very, very different because I see people, I'm seeing names being rattled off like Sean King. Yeah. I'm seeing, you know, there's there's a few. But yeah, you hit that nail right on the head, so to speak, uh, Hope. That was really good. So we're going to pivot into you now. I want to talk about you. Um, I need to know, let me know, what have you, is there anything that you have been reading? Is there anything that you've been watching? Is there anything that you've been listening to? I asked this question to all of my guests, but especially, I feel like it's especially important in the COVID of it all. What's been keeping you occupied when you're not working? Audrey Lord. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have this Sister Outsider by her, but I haven't started reading it. Oh, uh, this is a collection of poems by Audrey. And it does have some of the, the, uh, the work that's in Sister Outsider, but I am inundated in this work and in this book. And I love this woman. Um, Honestly, there's so much work in here that I've never even heard of. So thankful to Norton, the people that published this book, because whoever it was, they have, they obviously were huge fans and they did some amazing research. This book has gotten me through a lot of dark days. Um, and I got it for my birthday. I had my Amazon wish list up and it was one of those things where I definitely, I appreciate, you know, um, we don't block haters. We allow haters to do what they do and then we ignore them because when you're talking to yourself and nobody pays you any attention, then you seem like you're the silly one, right? But we don't block people. We allow them to get whatever education we have to offer them and we ignore them. So y'all pay attention to the conversation and allow Carl to have whatever yeah, conversation. I'm looking like I'm trying to scroll like what's going on, but go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, leave him where he at. This is an educational moment. And even if he's in here trolling, he still has to listen to trolls. So let him do what he do. Um, but yeah, but this book is really, really good. I absolutely love this book. And it's been like, let me see. Where is my... Ha ha ha. Boom. So my favorite one is The Brown Menace or The Poem of Survival of the Roaches. And to me, it is like one of the best poem and i <laughs> that's how this book got a crease in it on this page because i've read it so many times but for me it's one of those things where it talks about the struggle of black people in this moment right now right the survival of the roaches roaches you know being the way that white folks see black people and it talks about the struggle of being able to survive through anything because as we know roaches could survive through a nuclear war you know and um, i really really love um that particular poem and this book has just been keeping me sane. I read a couple of poems a day, go through, highlight a couple of things, and then I'm about I'm on my way. I love that's, it. You know, that's so funny that I love that you're a highlight girl too, because I do highlights and post-its. I'm right now I'm on Bell Hooks All About Love. It's been taking me a minute to get through it and it's an easy read. It's mm -hmm. just the I be having a, I have a lot going on right now. So reading is not and I I'm I'm not really an audiobook girl. I like a tangible book. 
with the, I like reading, you know? Agreed. Oh, um, someone asked for the title and the author, uh, if you could, don't mind saying again. So the title of this book is called The Collective Poems of Audre Lorde. Um, and it doesn't have an author because she's the author. They just, you know, collected a bunch of poems. But the publisher is Norton. So okay. if you up the book, the publisher is Norton. And then here is what it looks like so that you know where to kind of go. Yeah. But it so is... So Hope, you gave, you gave us what you've been reading. Is there anything that you've been watching on TV? I want to know what you watch. I want to know what you listen to. I know that you have a podcast, which we're going to talk about, but are there any other podcasts you listen to, music? What's going on? Okay, so watching, nothing at the moment because I haven't really had, I'm not really a TV girl, I'm a music girl. So music, I can get into, I can get into that with you all day, but I'm not really a TV girl. Um, I have like my shows that I go to sleep to. So like I'm a huge cartoon person at night. I love Family Guy and American Dad and all of the raunchy, you know, um, adult humor. Um, Do you like Big Mouth on Netflix? I love Big Mouth on Netflix. Me too. Me it's too. Me I too. love Big Mouth. <laughs> I love Big Mouth on Netflix. It is one of my favorites. I absolutely love it. Um, but I think that once, um, what is it? Ozark. Once Ozark comes back, I'm, I'm tuned in. It's one of my favorite shows. Um, and I've been catching up on Moesha because I love that. Was, if you read my book, um, Moesha is part of the reason that Hope is existing. It's a part of my aesthetic. It's a part of the the way that I kind of sort of um, manage myself around womanhood. Even though now that I'm looking at it as an adult, I realized that Moesha was kind of a stuck up little brat. <laughs> but when I was younger, um, the lessons that I took from her were really positive and really are, were about being a woman and kind of sort of holding your own and creating space that where there was no space for you before and mm -hmm. not sort of like dictate your womanhood and how that was supposed to look so i absolutely love that they put it on netflix because it is my favorite and now i just need them to put cinderella uh with brandy in it on disney plus and i will be a happy girl so that's what that is um as far as music is concerned uh on my ratchet playlist i have a lot of mulatto right now i have a lot okay. of I have a lot of, um, there's a, a woman that I stumbled upon. Her name is Marcy White. I am in love. She is, she has this song called Boomerang that is my shit. So ratchet, but I absolutely love it. All her music is just like real hood, real gutter, real Florida. Um, and then of course, Ball Greasy, who is a, a, a local Miami who should be a lot more famous than he actually is. Mm -hmm. Love him another mixtape coming out soon so that's my ratchet playlist and then a lot of the old classics i'm still listening to um lemonade the miseducation of warren hill is always on replay um as well as the mtv unplugged with lauren hill is always on replay oh my and gosh oh my gosh talk about you. rip your heart out of your body oh my that unplugged baby always i love it Absolutely. so that's theory and Barellis. I'm always listening to Sarah Bareilles as well. She's like one of my favorites. Oh, is that? I'm not going to write you a love song. Yes, I love it. Love her. Okay, okay, Sarah. Okay, we, we love to see it. Love to see it. Um, so, Hope, I just lost my train of thought. Well, I have questions for you. Jot it down. But let's talk. Let's really pivot into how you're practicing. Because you kind of touched on this at the beginning when I mentioned all of the hats that you wear. I would like to know, in what ways does Hope Giselle practice self-care? What does that look like for you? Because I imagine, you know, the old adage, you can't pour from an empty cup. And every time I see you pouring, the cup appears to be from, from the brim. Because you be, you be saying it like you mean it. You write it like you mean it. Like, there's never really any big, like, slip up, so to speak. And I know that's subjective. But yeah. every time, like, you come with the same energy, you never sing. Because I'll be tired. I'm telling you, this summer wore me out. Every time the phone rang and they're talking Black trans lives and another statistic and Black lives in general, yes. on top of just 20, I'm like, you are, like, I've got to turn down things. Like, for my self-care, I've, I've literally had to turn down things. Because I'm like, you all, I mentally, I, I don't have the bandwidth. So how yeah. do you stay afloat? Honestly, um, my boyfriend is my safe place. Um, I, I really love him. And it, it'll be a year, actually, on the 28th of this month. And he is a safe place for me. I, I, when I say that, like, 
I, I go to him and it's a it's not a dumping ground, but it's an exchange of energy. And we kind of just cleanse each other. And it's about to happen. Um, we're going to get together again at the end of this month. And it's a, it's a cleansing for the both of us. We kind of just come together and we release all of that negative energy into a whole different space, into our space, and then we just hold up for like a week. Um, is this is this the man that you were uh that that you refer to as Tarzan? This is the man that I refer to as Tarzan. Now, how he get that name, Hope? Tell us the tea. How how he get the name Tarzan? Are you Jane? It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> well, I guess okay. So I I have nicknames for all of my boyfriends whenever I am really with them. The only one that doesn't have one because I was too young um, was my first boyfriend, but his. Uh, nickname for me was Pumpkin because of Moesha and then Cinderella is my favorite movie so he used to call yeah. me Pumpkin. Um, but anyway I before the before Tarzan there was the lion and that was because of his hair and his aesthetic and he could sing so uh, his roar was his singing voice and then Tarzan got his name because of his aesthetic um, and then as well as like his he's such a man he's like such a little dirty bird like he is <laughs> and such like this groundy like whatever kill a bug with my bare hands kind of guy um and he's just oh, so my he, kind of, he country not even he's not country he's a, he's a very city boy but he's just he's he's a man's man like he's just a man just a okay. real man mainly I, I love this and it seems like you found a balance because see Hope, I'm not going to tell the story here. I do an after show after this. And everyone who follows me on Twitter knows that I had a date from hell this week. Ooh. I've been staying, like, in the house, you know, because of social distancing and stuff. But, baby, I, I, I don't even want to get into it because I have to pres literally preserve my energy for hour two. But I love to see the girls in love. I love that for you. And you all have been together for a year, you said, right? I don't want to ask you this. Do you date... Like, have you been able to date frequently? Because I know personally, I'm unlearning being a secret. That has literally been my dating history, has been being a secret. So I'm unlearning some of the uh, complicated, I guess, uh, positionings within that. Like, just literally removing myself from that. I'm not interested in being a secret. I want to be loved out loud. But literally, from four, 14 is when I started, you know, date, when boys got involved. And I'm now 32. And I'm still, it's a work in progress every day, especially out here in Hollywood. It can get very tempting to slip back into that role. And uh, how have you, I guess, how have you reached this, this place that you're at now? Because you seem very well-rounded, like you know yourself, you love yourself. How, how did you reach this destination? Honestly, I've, I've had to fail several times. And there have been so many times where I've been telling myself, like, I'm on this journey of self-discovery, and I'm doing this, and I'm going to implement this into my life. And there's been a lot of that, and then taking what I need from each of those situations, and then inundating them into one solid plan that works for me. Um, but then also having that space that I do go to, where I'm able to unpack that safely, and mm -hmm. I'm able to be my most authentic self. And, you know... I'm never going to tell y'all that should, you know, it be in my cards to have a, a larger platform that y'all aren't going to find that like some idiot might have recorded me saying something silly or whatever the case may be. But having those outlets to just be able to say non-activist things, to just be able to speak my mind and speak my piece, no matter how problematic it might be, um, has been that saving grace for me because there was a, t a point in my life where I felt like I had to be perfect. And there was a point in my life where I felt like I had to appease every single person that was watching me or following me or you know gave me a compliment. And now I'm at a space where I have so much peace because the people that truly love me and fuck with me are here with me through it all. Like I have one of my hopefuls, her name is Sasha. And I love Sasha to death because Sasha does not mind holding me accountable and still fucking with me at the same time. Like, I love how, like, if I'm saying something that she doesn't necessarily agree with, she challenges it. It's never like this disrespectful, like, oh, Hope, you're stupid. I'm unfollowing you. It's always like, Hope, explain this to me. So what do you mean by this? Because that doesn't make sense to me. And even when people in the comments are like, Sasha, you need to shut up. Like, and it's not to say that those people are bandwagon fans, but it's to say that I enjoy the fact that Sasha has her own mindset yes and, yes you know follow me blindly over the bridge without mm -hmm. knowing whether or not there's you know a troll under the bridge um 
And so like having people like that in my life and then being able to just have a space where I can un unapologetically be me and then have another space where I can be unapologetically loved and then have other spaces where I can just be in, an, in and of myself is how I'm, how I'm making this work. I've learned that it's not just about creating the one space of, of peace and prosperity. It's about having multiple outlets and multiple spaces to just get where I need to go depending on my mood and the day and that's okay it's not just about having it all together in this one time yeah i totally respect that i it's funny i love how you touched it, uh, about being like the imperfect activist because one of the reasons why i have kind of rejected that title for myself even though people in the comments are like you're an activist to me Char. like i i do something but you know i I try not to compare, but you know, I'm no hope. I'm no Raquel. I'm no Ashley. Like I, I do what I can. But one of the reasons, two of the reasons why I have thoroughly just rejected that title for myself is for one, my mental capacity. And I feel like as a, as a visible trans woman, black trans woman, and I talked about this previously, I feel like they try to push us to one yeah. side or the other, meaning like yeah. you have to be an activist, even or though I this game doing like pop culture topics that's the majority of my resume is like news whether it be hard news like your channel seven or talking about how the kardashians are ended, ending after 20 seasons that's my that's where i feel most at home but i feel that as as my journey progresses um i'm being pushed into it's like you either gotta like recap recap all of drag race be a world of wonder girl or you gotta be an activist and there's nothing wrong with that but i'm just i think that i I just have to be true to myself. And it's, 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 it's something about the imperfect activist that I love that you stand in because I feel like John Q. Public, so to speak, is always holding activists to this, like much like we do pastors and things like that, like we as a community, like this like superhuman, incapable of mistake, blindly follow type figurehead. And I love that about you, that you have the wherewithal and the self-awareness to be like, look, y'all, what, what you see is what you get. Like, I'm going to talk myself, but I'm hope. And that's it. Like, I mean, even, like, I remember very early in my in my activism career where I had an, an elder trans woman kind of get on one of my lives after I, I felt like I killed it right because at the beginning of the activism career it was all about how many views can you get and how many people like the video and like and so I remember there was one video I can't remember what I was talking about but like I felt like I killed it I got like a thousand people to watch it it was really dope and that was before you could go live so like if you got a thousand people to watch a video that you recorded and then uploaded girl you were the yeah girl. yeah right? and so um an uh, elder trans woman jumped into my inbox and she was just like, Hope, I just have one thing to say. I think that you're so amazing, but as trans women, there's an image that we have to uphold. And I don't think that it's good. It's a good idea for you to get online without your makeup. What? And that made me feel so insecure. But in the same moment, I believe that that was the day where I decided that I'm wearing less makeup and then no makeup because I don't believe in subscribing to this era where trans women feel like we have to perform every single day mm -hmm. of our life. That's just not realistic. It's not realistic that if I get out of bed, you know, and I'm late, that I then have to not only be late, but then dock myself pay because as a trans woman, I have to have makeup on, you know, or I have to do X, Y, and Z. Now, if that's your stick, if that's what makes you feel comfortable, if that's your place of solace, then feel free to do that. But I don't want to be bound by that. And there was a time where I was. There was a time where I could not go... <laughs> You know, I couldn't go to the Walmart if I didn't have on a full beat and a lash, which is, which is crazy. Same. And um, <laughs> now I make it my business to show up in the world as I am, how I am in that moment. And like my hopefuls, I mean, y'all know, people see like there are some days they, they hop on there and it's like, oh, yes, hope this beat, this face, this hair. But most of the time it's a bonnet, it's however these <laughs> Look, when I turn the camera on, it's whatever happens when I, you know, while I'm cooking or whatever the case may be. And I think that it's, for me, it's about normalizing the fact that trans women are not Barbie dolls and that we're actual human beings who get a chance to be normal and live normal lives. Yes, I can give you full coverage, cunt, you know, contour to the gods, black body. Yes. Also going to give you Sunday morning wash face. Oh, my God, I got the time zones wrong and I was an hour late. You're like, oh. there, I can give you all of that. I can give you all of that. And I think that that's the beautiful part about being a trans woman is that I should be able to present those things and not feel insecure about what that says about my womanhood. And so that's what I've learned. Again, again, allow me to piggyback. Like 2020 is the year that I got 
way more comfortable with myself. Like, I literally only wear makeup at this point to do this because that's just part, that's just, that's just sharp, okay? Right. But, but prior to uh, that, like, I felt, I kind of felt bogged down in, in the ways in which I chose to perform femininity, but I feel that those ways that I performed it were honest. I don't feel like it was a, like, performance, so to speak. Like, I wasn't dragging my feet to do my hair and makeup. I love my hair and makeup. Right. I always tell people that my mom and her sisters are Southern Bells, and I grew up influenced by hair, makeup, nails, fragrance. That's the aesthetic, girls. And for me, for me, and I understand like the patriarchal roots and the misogynistic roots in that in, in a lot of that presentation. But also, these are things that just come together to make me feel good. But I love that you mentioned just I guess like the duality of our experience and how we can do both, and we're valid as and it's not like this binary thing like no makeup or makeup, but we just can be these multifaceted beings, and it does not validate or invalidate the way in which we show up. Exactly. I mean, 2020 taught me that hope. I'm not joking. 2020, I got so raw, real, and honest and comfortable with myself in ways that if the world were still spinning, if there were no COVID, I would have still been on that carousel, still being the doll, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. There are some days, especially as a former makeup artist, where I'm just like, paint it on, paint it on thick. Yeah. Like, yeah. There are other days where I just, I don't, I don't like the idea of having to present a certain way for people. And I, I've made videos about it uh, uh, recently where I'm just like, if the only time that you're willing to listen to women of any, you know, experience is when we're overpainted or dolled up, there's something wrong with the way that you're seeking activism, right? If you're seeking activism from people who look a certain way, then you're not really seeking activism. What you're seeking is a fan, like is, is seeking to be a fan. I don't need fans. I need people who want to be educated. I don't care if you like hope as a person, but as long as you can take this information that I'm giving to you and disseminate it to the people that need to hear it, you can hate me for all I care. Just, you know, come and listen to this word that I have to give. Um, and I think that oftentimes what, what, I, what used to really bother me, and I think that was the thing that really kind of made me say, you know what, I'm going to wipe my face off before I get on here when I have something important to say, is because I would be talking about, you know, politics and voting and, you know, all the importance of doing X, Y, and Z. And people would be in the comments like, yes, girl, this hair is late. Oh, my God, that cut crease is sickening. And I'm just like, no, <laughs> we are not. You know, we are not here for that. So um, now they people usually get this, and I'm, I'm I think I'm I'm okay with you know just letting people see what it is when it ain't painted up, and you either like it or you don't like it. But somebody's son does, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so yes. I, I love it, Hope. I love it. So let let's talk a little bit about the Allow Me movement. You started an initiative. What is Allow Me? Let let me and the good people know what that is. So Allow Me is my nonprofit that is specifically geared towards black and brown uh, LGBT kids of color, right, for inner cities. And what our goal is, is what I, ugh, what our goal is to do is to create spider webs. And these spider webs will help these children become leaders that will help them sort of uh, find their way through life. What I found is that when I was growing up or when I got out of my mom's home and I actually had this independence that like all queer kids usually seek, especially if we find our queerness while we're in the home, um, I didn't have any like, people to ring off on. And the beauty of it is that with Allow Me, we're connecting people within their communities with actual LGBT folks and allies who are already doing the work. So it's about reminding our kids that not only are you not out here alone, you can always ring one of these silk nets and linings and somebody will come and, you know, realize that it's feeding time to come and give you information. But it's a space where we're reminding them that you can be more than a hairstylist. You can be more than a fashion designer. You can actually be a doctor and be trans if you'd like. You can actually be a lawyer and be trans if you'd like. We have Brianna, who is a part of the Box 5112, who is you know, starting her first year as being a lawyer. And she'll be a part of the people that we are um, helping with the Allow Me movement. So essentially, it's one big spider web that connects us all to you know, these youth and these kids and reminds them that, like you said, our only paths are not these stereotypical traditional paths as LGBT people. We are leaders and these things will help us to kind of sort of inundate that and get these kids voices out there as well. Um, so the main goal with Allow Me is to make sure that they know that we exist. A lot of the time, okay. Um, a lot of the time what I want to do um, or what I'm saying that I want to do in 2021 is I want to have a cohort, my first cohort of about five or seven kids and fly them out to DC and have about 12 or so mentors um, from all over my life just come and inundate these kids with all of this information um, and then have that 
information kind of sort of be spit back at us at the end of the program. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, um, it's a really rough draft kind of sort of, I hate my elevator pitch right now, but on paper, it's been written out in this very eloquent way, but explaining it is always really hard. I think that it's better for me to just try to like, show people um, or when I'm not on the spot, but I always get so like whacked out whenever it's brought up because there are so many things that I want to do with it. Um, but for the most part, Allow Me is a space where kids can come and learn how to be their best selves, especially queer, black, and brown kids, because we don't get the opportunity to do that most uh, oftentimes. Oftentimes, we do not. I love that. And you all can go to, it, it's HopeDisguise.com, right? Giselle.com. It used to be HopeDisguise.com. Oh, Giselle.com and learn more about the Allow Me movement, because that's how I learned about it. I went to your website, girl. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And so you also, congratulations, your podcast, Can We Talk? You just, uh, you're collaborated with iHeartMedia? Yes, iHeartRadio um, actually picked it up. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I, because a lot of people, um, a lot of people were asking me yesterday, like, so how, you know, like, how did it work? Like, how do you do this? Like, how did, like, what deal? Like, and I'm just like, I didn't do anything. Like, I was minding my black trans owned business and like, I mean, it, it, like, and they came out of nowhere and were just like, hey, um, you know, we have decided to carry Can We Talk podcast on our whatever, whatever, whatever. And I thought, at first I thought it was a scam. I thought it was like, you know, some random ass hater that was just like, let's get her together today. Um, and then I deleted the email. And so there was like, okay, whatever. Sure, iHeartRadio wants to carry my little show. And then I went on there. Something just was like, well, did you actually check the website? And I went on and I typed in, can we talk with Hope Giselle? And lo and behold, I am there. So um, I actually have a meeting with them tomorrow because I had to go back into my deleted messages. <laughs> <I never did. laughs> um, but I have a meeting with them tomorrow to talk logistics about what this even means because I was just floored by the opportunity they saw a little black trans girl talking shit with a bunch of people and were like, oh, we like that. Let's gonna put that on our platform where there are millions and billions of people that have access to it. So forever grateful, super happy about it. I just, I'm, I'm still over the moon about that whole idea. That's a huge accomplishment. That is literally huge. Not everyone has that to their credit. You're looking at a girl who doesn't. I'm so happy and proud of you though. <laughs> but, uh, and then finally, you, you're an author. So is your book autobiography, uh, like an autobiography? Yes. So Becoming Hope, Removing the Disguise, it is in my bio for those people who want to buy it. I know that people are always like, well, where can I buy it? It's in the link is in my bio. Um, and it's actually a biography that tells my story from the beginning. You don't really get a lot of hope in, in that biography because I wanted to make sure that people understood who I was before hope became a person or before hope came into fruition for me. Um, unlike a lot of people, I wasn't... Um, just hell bent on being a girl. There were a lot of years in my life where I was like, oh, I'm okay just being like this little fanboy and gay kid. Um, and I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to talk about my struggle growing up and just dealing with, you know, being gay in the hood, in Miami, having to deal with, you know, this complex that all the men have there. And then, you know, trying to be a normal kid, but understanding that I wasn't normal at all. And, you know, having all of these nuances to my blackness that helped to shape the woman that I am today. And so um, what you'll get in this book is becoming hope, but also like there's a portion of me sort of learning that this isn't, who I am, the, this, this, you know, uh, I guess Cliff Notes version of what women are supposed to be isn't exactly who I am. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the way that I wrote it and the feedback that I get from a lot of people is that it gives you so much without giving away everything. Um, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to give people very intimate looks at portions of my life that I felt really helped to shape me, but I didn't want people to become so intertwined with my life that they felt like they knew me better than I knew myself. I never mm -hmm. wanted to give so much away that, you know, people come up to me and they're like, yeah, because I knew about that one time where you did that one thing. And I'm like, wait, what? Did I ever, have I ever met you? And they're just like, no, it's in your book, right? And so I, I wanted to make sure that it was personable uh, and personal and something that the younger generation could relate to, but not something that they can take and be like, oh, girl, I'm your best friend now because I've read this book. Right. Right. And that can be a slippery slope when you write books about your life. That can be a real slippery slope. Very. 
Very. So I love that you uh, mentioned, I guess, like, I guess I'll say pre-medical transition. I, I don't know the, the verbiage there. But we both, you're from Miami. I'm from Chicago. We both went, you went to Alabama State University, ASU. I went to Langston University in Oklahoma. So we both went to HBCUs. I think I'm a bit older than you, though, if I'm not mistaken. Just a little. So what was your experience like there? And I ask that because for me, I, I felt like I had a great time at my alma mater. Like, and you, I should mention that you have a bachelor's and a master's in fine arts. Yeah. Work. I have a bachelor's in broadcast journalism. So what I felt with my time there is that I was like, okay, this was cool. You know, I had my fun. I was dipping with trade. I had my circle of girlfriends. I was running around with AKAs, Delft. Like, I had an HBCU experience, but it wasn't until I graduated and I kind of came more into my own and I did a little bit more reading and had a, a few more conversations that I realized that I feel like I was on autopilot in a lot of different instances out of survival because there was a lot of people trying to silence me, trying to hide me, trying to... And this was coming from faculty staff and my peers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I want to know, you know, Black woman who's trans to Black woman who's trans, who both are alma maters at HBCUs. Did you feel anything like, 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 and also before I finish this question, like, for example, I don't feel that familial unit with my alma mater. Like, I'm still cool with people, but I don't have like that pride. I'm not going back to homecoming every, like, I don't feel like that whole brother, sister, familial unit with them. So what was your experience like? I hated it. It was the worst four years of my life. Really? Um, it was. It was the worst four years of my life, and I say that proudly. You know, um, I say that proudly. Alabama State knows exactly how I feel about Alabama State, which is why they don't invite me back to anything. Um, but I didn't enjoy it. Outside of what I feel like was one of the best fine arts educations that I could have gotten, the social experience of being on campus and having to teach faculty members how I wanted to be treated as a student, having to be the first, like, I mean, it, it's great now to be able to have those accolades and say like, oh, the first so-and-so, and like, I did X, Y, and Z for the campus. As a student, I should not have had to do that. I shouldn't have had to take out extra time from my studies to come and have hour-long meetings with faculty members. I'd be like, I'm crazy, you know? Um, you know, and teach them how to treat students. That's what Title IX is for. That is what, you know, like these um, sensitivity trainings and stuff are for. And I think that that's why I kind of fell into the work that I fall into now when I do contracts, because I don't want any other students to have to feel like they have to go back and teach their faculty and staff how to treat them. I shouldn't have, I, I shouldn't have had to make friends with the janitor lady who cleaned my dorm hall for the first year of my schooling because nobody like wanted to hang out with me. It, it was just, it was one of those things where socially and mentally and emotionally those four years drained me. And without the couple of friends that I made and kind of sort of had like that very tight knit circle, I don't think I would have survived. I had two suicide attempts when I was at Alabama State and never in my life did I, you know, like, Never, never in my life had it been that bad. Outside of like one time when I was young that I detailed in the book, um, it had never been so bad that I wanted to try to kill myself twice in, in the same sort of like time frame. Um, and it was just a horrible experience. I didn't go to homecoming when I was there. I've never been to a Turkey Day Classic. I've never been to, I went to one football game and um, it was my freshman year and I was still like fresh into androgyny, but not my transition. Um, mm -hmm. And there were so many adult people uh, especially, mind you, this is like my first time away from home. I graduated early, so I got to college when I was 17. Um, and so I'm still kind of getting used to the world and the way that people see it. And just like walking past people at the football game and like hearing them snicker and say really rude and disgusting things just threw me off for the next four years. So I never went to another football game, never went to a classic, never went to homecoming. Every spring break, I was in my dorm by myself. Even when I did get like friends, I never did spring break because I knew that there were gonna be people from the school. And if they made me feel miserable at school, I can only imagine how they were gonna make me feel at a beach in Florida where I'm from, you know? And so I, I just had a, a really horrible experience. And when I found hope my last two years of school, um, it got worse 
but it also got better because I learned to just not care. I learned to say, I'm going to demand my respect on this campus. I learned to say that I am not going to have to fight every single one of you to get it. Um, I learned the law and I made sure that faculty members, staff, and even some students knew what that law was and knew that I knew what that law was. And I just kind of pushed through it all. You know, and as a, a fine arts uh, theater major, I only ever was in one show, and it was because in front of my entire, um, in front of my entire department, my department head told me in front of everybody, faculty, staff, students, we had like a huge lock-in, that's what we used to call them, and um, I think there was like a couple of the students were trying to stick up for me, and they were just like, well, why, because at the time, you know, <clears throat> he is like an amazing artist like y'all praise him so much because they did they would praise me and say that my audition was one of the best auditions that they had seen in like 30 years um and they were just like well what like why are y'all not letting him perform and my department head straight up said until you stop looking like that you'll never be on my stage Ooh, so the time that i ever performed was when they did rent and of course i played angel um and that was my senior year on the way out the door like literally <laughs> it was like my exiting sort of speech. Yeah, yeah, like a little siren song. See, okay, and we'll probably, you know, we'll, you, our different, our, uh, my experience was bad, but goddamn home. Good Lord. Yeah. Good Lord, you really went through it at ASU. Yeah, it sucked. There were, now I'm not gonna act like, you know, it was just like horrible, 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 because there were some people who helped me to get through that. Um, but, and, and uh, there's my mentor down there telling y'all, like, it's a new day. Like, the things that I went <laughs> The things that I went through helped to pave the way for the, the new babies that are there. Yes, now. same, same. I feel, yeah. I, I, I get messages, same, yeah. same. My, my experience was not nearly as bad, uh, but it still was. Like I said, mine was in, in one of those things, like in hindsight, I was like, I was on autopilot. Like when that professor said that to me, that was not okay. When this happened, that was not okay. But I was so used to having things just roll off my back. Like you can call yeah. me. Like, I think what kept me afloat, which is so toxic, but this is what got me through undergrad, was knowing that I was, you know, doing up to things. <laughs> and that kind of like affirmed me like, oh, you can say what you want, but uh, at 7 p.m. today, you know, I'll be granted. I had to become a character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe doing tuck and rolls, you know, to, to get in and out of rooms. But I was up to things, Hope. I was up to things. <laughs> I'm not about to do it with you. Not second not second rolls. I can't. I, but I love it. Yeah, but <laughs> I, is, I, love I hope it. this was such an informative conversation. I'm so glad. It was nice meeting you. You know, you. I can't wait till this is over. And then, you know, maybe I come to LA or, I mean, you come to LA or whatever and we I, connect in person. But thank you so, 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 so much for taking time out of your day and your schedule to join me for Sundays with Char. This was just such a fun conversation. And of course, it'll be on my IGTV. Um, you all can go back and watch it. Be sure to listen to the Can We Talk podcast. Go subscribe to that. Check out Hope's 501c3, Allow Me. And uh, check out Hope's, what's the name of your book, Hope? It's Becoming Hope, Removing the Disguise. And it is in my, the link that's in my bio, so you don't have to look hard. All right. And for those of you who like to stick around and get in my business, you'll learn about my date from hell in the next hour in my after show. Thanks, Hope. Have a great day. And enjoy Versus. Yeah. <laughs> Love you, sis. Bye bye. All right. I have one minute left. I'm going to touch up my tea. I'm going to get in my tea. And then you all, I have a story to tell you. I have a, oh, I see I have a question. Oh, wait. No, somebody was trying to go live. Excuse me. But anyway, yes, I'm about to touch up my tea. I got my notes, jot it down, and come back for hour two. I'll be right back. All right now. <laughs>